Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to say hello and welcome to everybody who's joining us today for a very important uh, talk about cybersecurity, something that everybody, if they aren't interested, really should be interested and watchful of. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Kelly Downing, President and CEO of Bartlett Wealth Management, and I'm excited to have you here today and glad that you chose to join us for Behind the Screens 2020. Uh, at Bartlett, we recognize that cybersecurity continues to become increasingly important for all of us as we prioritize the safety of our clients and our safety measures for the company as well. Joining us today, we have two experts, Neil O'Farrell, who some of you might have seen um, in a, a previous seminar, and we have Brett Johnson uh, joining us for the first time today. Bart Bartlett has partnered with Neil since 2019 as Bartlett's exclusive cybersecurity expert, and he told me today he's been doing so much for us that he needs a birthday present uh, <laughs> next time his birthday comes around. Neil is the brains behind Bartlett's online cybersecurity education center, uh, which can be found at uh, bartlett.thinksecurityfirst.today. Some of you may remember attending Bartlett's cybersecurity presentation last year when Neil hosted it, so we're, welcome, we're excited to have him back today um, by popular demand. Neil has spent nearly 40 years fighting cybercrime and identity theft around the world. And today he will host our discussion with his partner in crime, literally. Brett Johnson was the first cyber criminal named to the FBI's most wanted list in 2006, as well as one of the founding members of what we know today as the dark web. I'm not sure I still understand what the dark web is, but maybe he'll enlighten us today about that. Brett was described by the Secret Service as the original internet godfather. Well, today Brett has turned a corner and now uses his cyber prowess for good. He has taught at the FBI Academy and has worked with Visa, Capital One, American Express, and Microsoft. So thank you both for hosting today's conversation and for pro providing us an exclusive look at cybersecurity and our climate today. I'm excited to hear what both of you have to say to us, and I'm going to turn it over to Neil Farrell in just a minute. Um, for all the participants, uh, we will have a Q&A session um, at about 2.45, and in the meantime, if you have some questions, uh, hopefully everyone knows how to use the three buttons at the top and you can do the chat function so you can type in uh, some of your questions on the chat. So Neil, take it away. Thanks Kelly. Um, uh, thanks Bartlett. Again, uh, it, it's great that this is uh, um, a the latest in the series of performances. I think you've been really taking a lead and getting the word out there so I really do appreciate that. Um, so yeah, over the next uh, hour or so, we're going to take you inside the world of cybercrime and identity fraud, hopefully in a way that you've never seen or been before. Um, I'm going to dive straight in. Brett, can you hear me? Are you there? I'm here, Neil. How are you? I am wonderful. So you're coming to us today from sunny Birmingham. Well, it's not so sunny today, but hey, it is what it is. Okay. So that's Birmingham, me on. Birmingham, Alabama, not Birmingham, England. Birmingham, Alabama, yes, sir. Okay, no sunshine there. Okay, okay. So <laughs> we're going to start off with a, a, a simple trick question. I know I like to open these a little bit casually. So let's start with this. Pick a number between 1 and 10. 10. Wrong. I thought you'd get this. <laughs> 6 trillion. 6 trillion. Ah. I thought you'd get this. Okay, so we'll have to have a talk afterwards. But 6 trillion dollars is the amount that we're losing every year to cyber crime and identity theft and in the old days it was partly to guys like you um that's you know one of the frightening array of numbers that are the reason probably that we're here today so we think we're losing about six trillion in 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 losses and costs and security and fraud um a, a year cyber criminals are making about a trillion a trillion and a half from that according to various estimates um 
data breaches. We're losing, I think the most recent estimate I saw last year was 15 billion um, records exposed in data breaches just last year. And I, 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 we talked about this before. When I was a lad, cybercrime was meh. You know, it was only millions. That was huge. And as I was growing up, it, was, it became uh, buh into the billions. And um, now as I grow older and head off into the sunset, we're up in the, tr in the trillions and everyone's going, meh, so what? And I, I think part of what we're going to do here today is, you know, unravel the, um, the so what. So sure. we've also got identity theft still claiming a million new victims every 30 days, one every two or three seconds. It's costing them in out-of-pocket expenses three three and a half billion. Um, and then COVID came along and the numbers started to look really bad, right? I mean, we, we yeah, again, we're talking about this the other day that the world of cybercrime uh, relishes disruption and distraction. Um, and COVID has disrupted the entire world. And as a result, those numbers we're seeing are looking tame. We're seeing a uh, thirty thousand percent increase in COVID related attacks. Thirty thousand percent. Right. Um, well, you, you, are you seeing that on the dark web? Are you seeing that in your world? Are, are those numbers any anywhere close to reality? The the thing about COVID is is COVID and the world at large today has has basically caused a one eighty with the way cybercrime operates. It used to be, and when I was running Shadow Crew, Shadow Crew was a teaching environment as well as just a platform to buy and sell criminal products. But one of the lessons that was taught was a criminal should never act out of desperation mm -hmm. because you're desperate to gather data. You're desperate to lose data before the data dies. You're desperate to cash out, to put cash in pocket before a financial institution freezes the account and you can't get the money out. So there's desperation on all facets of criminal activity online for the criminal. What COVID has done is it's done a 180. It's caused a 180 in that paradigm. So now criminals are no longer desperate. Criminals are calm, cool, collected, and calculating. It's the individual, the citizen, that's now desperate. We've got 40 million Americans out of work now. We've got businesses that are in danger of being bankrupt. We've got people who are looking at their retirement accounts and are worried that, hey, what's happening with my retirement mm -hmm. funds now? Are my retirement funds going to be stolen? What's going on with that? So now it's the individual that's desperate and the criminals are not. And because of that, we see these cybercrime numbers going through the roof. 30,000%. Honestly, Neil, I'm going to tell you, I think that may be low. It's a field day for criminals right now. Every single type of fraud and crime that you can imagine is wide open across the spectrum right now. Yeah. And what a, I, I remember having this conversation with someone else. In fact, it might have been you. I said one of the bright spots in this is that we've seen identity theft victims, uh, the number reduced in the last couple of years from a little over 16 million to last year, a little over 13 million. And, you know, still a million a month. It's still not sure. anything to get excited about. And I remember, in fact, it was you because you said, yeah, it's not time to celebrate because it doesn't mean that they're not after you. They're just chasing something else. And it brought me back to a com to a um, conversation I had a couple of years ago. I was at a uh, a, uh, a panel event in San Francisco, and we we're talking about these numbers of nine, ten billion rec you know billion records being exposed in data breaches every single year, and how awful that was. And someone in the audience put up his hand and he said, "Well, look, if we're losing all this information, if we're losing all our information many times over every year, why are we not?" Victims of identity theft, all of us, many times over every year. And the kind of the panel was going, hmm, but, uh, yeah, no good answers for that. And I remember my kind of smarty, snarky self said, it's called the, um, uh, the net effect, not enough thieves. And, and, you know, people laughed, people smirked. I felt kind of a little embarrassed. I, thought, I actually meant that what we saw on the, on, on, on the dark web and in, surface web and all crim criminal enterprise, we have these torrents, these tsunamis of stolen data, and not that many thieves out there who are capable of weaponizing and monetizing the data. And kind of the, the word was, well, just, you know, wait your turn, sit down, be patient, your time will come, you will be a victim. And I remember saying at the end of it, what we need to fear is when they automate their attacks. And You're absolutely fast right. Here, here's, the, the thing is, is that we need to accept that all of our information has been compromised. Mm 
Right. This idea that, that there's something that we can do to make sure that our PII has not been compromised, that, that ship has sailed. Yeah. Our PII is readily available from websites like RoboCheck, where I can buy anyone's social security number and date of birth for, I think it's $4.40 right now, right. to uh, data collectors, legal data collectors like Ben Verified or Spokio, where you can pull background checks on people, unlimited background checks for $24 a month. Right. Everyone's information is readily available. So if we understand that, if we accept that, so just last year you had uh, 2.6 billion records compromised. That's on the low estimate of 1,500 just reported breaches just last year. Okay. Right. So everyone's information is out there. So we need to accept that. Once we accept that and understand the more popular you are, the more money you make, the more likely you are to be a victim. Mm -hmm. All right. That, that criminals don't look at people who don't make money. They're, they're, we're looking, the people, person I used to be, we look for money. That's what we want. So right. we're not going to go and get somebody that's a taxi driver. Not that we won't victimize a taxi driver, sure. but the money comes from more high profile targets. Right. So you need to accept that your, your information has been compromised. Once you accept that, what can you do to make sure that if a thief has it, that he doesn't use it? Yeah, and, that, and that's when we switch from identity theft to account takeover, which was really scary because identity theft, you can usually make it go away pretty quickly. You call your credit card company, they cancel a card. If they take over your account, they've got your money. And you're right, if they take over an account, it's got to be an account with money in it. If it has an overdraft, they're not into the debt acquisition business. They don't want to take over your overdraft. But what we saw from this um, automation of attacks was a surge in credential stuffing. So now we have these thieves had all this information, plus they had the tools to automate the attacks. So when I was coming to a point in my life when I used to say, I think I've seen everything, and then credential stuffing comes along, and I think it is the one threat that is going to change everything for businesses and for consumers because it's almost impossible to stop unless you change your behavior. You want to have a go at explaining what credential stuffing is from a criminal's perspective? Sure, let's talk about that. So former, let's ask, former, let's criminal. Ask, former criminal, now cybersecurity expert. So let's ask a question to the audience out there. Let's ask how many people out there use the same login and password across multiple websites? Let's just raise our hands. We're in the confines of our own home because of COVID-19. No one can see us raise our hands. Let's raise our hands. I'll raise mine. I'll admit it. It's kind of like an AA meeting. I'm Brett Johnson. I use the same password across multiple websites. 80%, 80% of everyone on the planet yeah. uses the same password. We get, now, here's we get where lazy. That, we get lazy. So here's where that creates an issue, okay? I can send out a phishing email that looks like it comes from Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo. Right. Your level of awareness may be high enough that you say to yourself, oh, that's a phishing email. There's no way I'm going to fall for that. But say I send out a phishing email that looks like it comes from Hulu. Is your level of awareness going to be as high? Probably not. You're probably going to say, Hulu? Does anyone even watch Hulu? I mean, the only thing they've got is The Handmaid's Tale, and that second season sucked. So, no, your level of awareness is not going to be as high. But right. if you're among that 80% that uses the same password, the same login across multiple websites, you've used the same password for Hulu that you've used for Bank of America. So it's an automated program. It's that automation that you're talking about. That little guy in his, in his mom's basement that's got the computer set up, that's got the matrix background rolling in the back, he mm -hmm. goes to sleep one night. He's got your login credentials. He's, it, a program automatically plugs it into hundreds of thousands of websites overnight to see right. what combination that works with. The next morning he wakes up, he's got your tax records. He's got your credit reports. He's got your bank accounts. He's got your credit cards. He's got your Hulu account. He's got right. everything across the board. He owns you at that point. From that point, it's very easy to pull your complete identity information, your, your social security, your date of birth, your background check, and make a complete identity profile so that he can empty out every single one of your accounts from that point. That's this idea of credential stuffing. And when you're talking about automating it, I'm the guy who created uh, tax return identity theft. The reason your all's tax returns are delayed every single year, me. I'm sorry about that, but that's the truth. I was able to file a tax return manually once every six minutes. Okay. 
uh, think about automating that. Instead of once every six minutes, you're, you're filing hundreds every minute. Bam, 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 bam. The only thing you need to do is trick the system into believing it's a human that's filing that. So automating attacks is an extreme danger that we are seeing right now. We're going to continue to see that as time progresses. Yeah, and in case you think this is just theoretical, uh, I, I started pulling some of the numbers from the last couple of years to see how these are accelerating. So if you look at it, let's you get a, you, you, you buy a million credentials on the, uh, the, the black market. Um, a credential is simply a username and a password or a, uh, a email address and a password. So you buy a million of these files. I'll explain in a minute how much they cost. Some of the numbers we're seeing are, suggest a success rate of up to 3%. So if you're, if you're running against a, hundred, a, hundred, or a million different credentials, you are successful up to 30,000 times. That's 30,000 accounts that you have an opportunity to take over. And so now what we're seeing, as of, I think the most recent data was a couple of months ago, we are seeing 87 million credential stuffing attacks every day. Every day, 87 million every day. 2017 to 2018, 64 billion of these attacks. And they are successful because we're seeing the money move around. We're seeing the Bitcoin move around. They are making about $50 million a day, $50 million a day from credential stuffing, which works out, I don't know, $15, $20 billion a year. So it's not theoretical. We're seeing this happen. And the only reason that it's working is because you keep using the same password over and over again, correct? That's it. That's it. I mean, we, uh, we are never trained on how to pick a secure password. We go to a sure. website. The website says use so many characters, uppercase, lowercase, throw in a few symbols. There's a graph that says weak, 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 weak. We continue to put something in until it says strong. And we're like, strong! We have no idea what makes it strong at all. Sure. All right? Absolutely. So we take, what, we take what we think is a strong, secure password. And we're like, well, hey, it, it works here. It'll work over there, too. So yeah, that's fine. Like, don't fix it if it's like not that. broken, right? Exactly. And the problem, again, is that level of awareness. If you're, if you're doing that, you're not going to be as, as attentive to your streaming services or your dating website as right. you are your financial records. But you're still allowing that access by using the same type of login or just a, a, a riff on that login. So instead of saying, well, my login is, is Dreamcast 45, I'll say that it's PlayStation 34 something like that. So it's still a riff on the existing type of password that you're using. And it's easy enough at that point for an attacker like I used to be to figure out what those passwords are for the websites. Yeah, and I just saw a question come in there that, you know, I think if I read it right, most of my accounts are email accounts, should I be worried? And that's a really important question because as a security person, I really don't get, care that you get into my Netflix account. I really don't care that you get into my Capital One account. If you get into my personal email account, you'll get 15 years of everybody I know, everybody I've done, I, I've, I've done business with. You will get attachments. You will get, uh, uh, you'll get all my contacts. You'll be able to figure out the name of my favorite teacher if I had one, and I'm not saying that I did. You, you'll figure out the name of my first pet, my, all, you know, all the, all the secret answers to those security questions. So of all the accounts that I worry about, it's my personal email. You get that, you get me, correct? Well, uh, certainly the email ha is a treasure trove of data. More importantly, the, the email, because I, I'm, I'm what's considered an upper tier attack, all right? The email for me allows me to commit things like business email compromise. All right. right? So I, I, get, <clears throat> I get access to your, your email, then I find someone in there that I want to target or use as a target. I will basically spook them. I will pretend to be them by registering something like a, what's called a Unicode domain. So it looks like it's right. google.com, but instead of it being Google or gmail.com, instead of it being Gmail, it'll, that I won't be an English alphabet I. It'll be a right. Cyrillic, a Russian alphabet I. It looks just the same. So if, I'll, I'll a, if you have my somebody. eyesight, you'll miss it, yeah. Most people will. Yeah. I mean, because at the end of the day, we check our email with this thing. Are you right. going to notice that a dot is not above an I? No, you're not. Sure. And you're going to fall for that type of stuff. That's why spear phishing is about 86% effective. It's successful. It works. Right. Uh, so business email compromise, once you get access to someone's email, if it's a CEO, if it's payroll, if it's someone of any import, someone that's valuable, 
At that point, I know that I'm able, as an attacker, as a criminal, I know that I'm able to make money just by having access to that email. Right. So, um, before we frighten the audience with any more big numbers, <laughs> I want to... I want to switch. I want to do a fast U-turn to something much sweeter and much nicer, the deep, dark web. So, oh. yeah. So, um, you have been accused of inventing the precursor, the forerunner, the early model, the prototype of the dark web about 15 years ago with Carter Planet and Shadow Crew when they right. busted Shadow Crew. So, in case people aren't aware... One of uh, um, Shadow Crew's more infamous members, apart from Brett, has a guy called Albert, Albert Gonzalez, who was the individual behind the massive TJ Maxx, TJX data breach, stole about 170 million credit and debit cards, tried to feed them through Shadow Crew and other places, got caught in a big Secret Service sting operation. He's now he's still in prison. 30 people were arrested around the world, I think roughly 30 people, except someone called Brett Johnson. So explain how Shadow Crew got started, what your role Ooh. is it, it was in it, and how that began. And, and I remember, that was a surface web. Anybody could log in there, correct? That wasn't sure. the dark web that we know today. Right. So, and, and we'll get into a uh, – I'll explain what the dark web is in just a moment as well. So the, the way this thing starts is I'm a career criminal or was. I started breaking the law when I was 10 years old, stealing food for me and my sister. And then as I grew older, I got more involved in the types of crimes and fraud that my mother committed. I grew up in that type of mindset and that type of lifestyle. Branched off onto my own, committing internet fraud in the mid to early to mid 90s. At that point in time, the only avenue you had to commit organized cybercrime was an IRC chat session. Now, IRC stands for Internet Relay Chat. It's this rolling chat board that you have no idea who you're talking to, if you can mm -hmm. trust someone, anything else like that. So you can't reference past conversations, can't do anything. If someone says they've got credit card information or PII, personal information, you have no idea if they've got it or not, or if they're just trying to rip you off because everyone there is a criminal, all right? So what happened was is I get ripped off. Imagine that, the criminal gets ripped off. I got so upset about being ripped off that we ended up starting this thing called Shadow Crew. So Shadow Crew is a precursor to today's dark web and dark web markets. It laid the foundation for the way modern cybercrime channels still operate today. I was convicted of 39 felonies. Those felonies had to do with refining modern financial cybercrime as we now know it. And of course, I went to prison. I escaped from prison. I did all that stuff. Um, the, the interesting thing that Shadow Crew did was it provides a trust mechanism for criminals to use. Now right. you've got a large communication channel. That channel is a forum type structure typically, all right, where now criminals from across different time zones can reference and take part in conversations that are days, weeks, months old. They can learn from those conversations. You know by looking at someone's screen name if that person can be trusted, if that person, what that skill level of, of that person is, if you can network or learn from that person. You know, uh, we have uh, on these criminal websites, you have vouchers, you have review systems, you have escrow systems in place so that you know if you buy a product or a service from another criminal that you are guaranteed to get that product or service and that product or service then works as it's advertised to work. So that changes the entire dynamic of cybercrime at that point in view and at, at that point in time and it's still in place in operation today there's been certain refinements one of the refinements there's two big refinements one is cryptocurrency like bitcoin which allows criminals to move massive amounts of value somewhat anonymously as long as they know how to properly use it the other big big move for cybercrime was what's called tor t-o-r the the onion router is what it stands for it's the dark it's basically the dark so Tor is a type of browser that you have to use in order to access the dark web. Now, for people who don't know what the dark web is, there are three parts of the internet. Think of the internet, and I hate to say this because I hate these presentations that, or these news reports that show this iceberg, all right? But think of it as an iceberg just for a second. You have the surface, you have the deep. So the surface, the surface web, you have the first, for the internet, for, you have the surface web, the deep web, and then the dark web. The surface web is every single thing that you can find by a Google search. Right. Okay, that's, a, that's a lot of information. 
But understand, that's only maybe 5% of the overall internet is what Google will show you, 5%. The other 95% is what's called the deep web. Now, what is the deep web? The deep web is everything that's behind a paywall. It's all your emails. Right. It's your banking information. Anything that doesn't have a URL, a website address, is the deep web. All of that data that's out there, that doesn't just disappear. It's out there on the internet. It's just you can't access it. It's part of the deep web. It's behind some sort of login wall, paywall, subscription wall, right. what have you. That takes care of the deep web. Now, within the deep web, we have this thing called the dark web. All right? Estimates on how big that is? Truthfully, Neil, no one really knows. We've seen estimates of several hundred thousand websites. We've seen estimates of 10,000 websites. We've seen a recent estimate of, well, well, you know, the criminal activities, maybe just a couple hundred websites. I tend to go more to, for criminal activity on the dark web. I tend to go more toward that of just a few hundred websites mm. is the only thing that it consists of, all right? Now, the thing about the dark web is it allows criminal activity to take place anonymously and not only criminal activity, but also the, the websites themselves can be hosted where it's extremely difficult for law enforcement to find out where that physical server is. Sure. Right? And that, that becomes a huge issue for law enforcement to, to track down these criminals and everything else if they know how to properly use it at that point. Um, at the types of crimes that are on there, now I, I want people to understand that the dark web is more than just criminal activity. There are tr there are troves of academia on there. There are um, websites like WikiLeaks. Uh, the dark web is used for U.S. operatives to be able to communicate with each other. It's used for people who are behind or, or citizen, a country's citizens who can't get past their sure. country's internet, like China, like Cuba. It's used for those people to be able to get word out, to be able to access information that their country doesn't want them to access. So there are good parts of the dark web. There are criminal parts. And when I say there are criminal parts, it's it's financial cybercrime. It's child pornography. It's uh, it's red rooms. So these torture rooms, those right. are existent. It's drug trafficking. It's um, human trafficking. It's, it's hitmen. So you have murder for hire. You have things like this that all take place on the dark web. The good news is for the people out there listening, you don't need to visit the dark web because here's what actually happens. For a financial cybercrime, yes, a lot of that is bought and sold on the dark web. But the actual crimes, they don't take place on the dark web. They take place on the surface web. You gather the data, buy it, and sell it on the dark web. That You're not going to stop that. But the actual crimes, the victimizing of people, the, still, the, the takeover of accounts, things like that, that takes place on the surface web. So that's where people need to be concentrated because most crime, I'm going to say 97, 98% of crime, takes place on the surface web, and that's where people need to be concentrated. Yeah, they, they need to understand that kind of cybercrime circulation system. The information is stolen from the internet that we all know. It's stolen from uh, your social media, if you're not setting it to private. It's stolen through data breaches, it's stolen through all right. kinds of mechanisms. It circulates down to the deep web. It's bought, it's sold, it's refined, it's analyzed with the tools that they have now. It's weaponized and organized so that it can be used to commit crimes, and then it comes back up to the surface web to, to commit the crimes. The, the dark web you have no control over, but the, 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 the entrance and the exit you have a lot of control over. Set your uh, social media accounts to private. Uh, protect your personal information. Guard your identity. Uh, uh, change your passwords often. Uh, and then when it I does, agree. so they're not getting that information. And then when it does come, ba come back up again, not reusing your passwords, using multi-factor authentication. So simply having a username and a password is nowhere near enough. So don't worry right. about the dark web like, is, is the message. But back to a point that you mentioned earlier, um, there may not be that many sites on the, or marketplaces on the dark web, but they are making an awful lot of money. If you look at just two that you probably know, um, uh, Alpha Bay and Silk Road, they only lasted for about two years each. But um, they made about a billion dollars each over those two years, right? So it's estimated uh, Silk Road, yes, made, a, made about a billion dollars. The more recent one was Alexander Kazas. He had a website called Alpha Bay. It was on the dark web. 240,000 members on that website. It was shut down by 
worldwide law enforcement July 5th of 2017. When it was shut down, it's estimated, now they, they, the federal law enforcement confiscated around $24 million from Alexander Kazas. What most people don't realize is, is that was not all of the money that was on the site at the time, because the way these marketplaces work, each user has a wallet on the marketplace that holds so much Bitcoin. You can fund it. It's like a bank account that's on, on, on the marketplace itself. The missing money that was on Alpha Bay is around $700 million. That's how much money was just there when the site was shut down that law enforcement never got to touch. So it's, it's out in criminal hands someplace. And that's just one website. That was 2017, 240,000 members. So you're right, there's not many websites, but the, the membership is large. Last year, there was a website shut down, Black Market, 1.15 million registered accounts. Numbers continue to grow, and that's just one website, just one website. And if you've got hundreds that have a million members, all of a sudden you've got a lot of criminal activity taking place. Okay, so I just got a message there. Could I please fix my audio? Can you hear me? I can, but it sounds like you're coming through your yeah, laptop. So I yeah, I unplugged my audio, so I'm just going to have to come to the, the, the microphone of the device. So I shall speak up and carry a large stick. So, okay. So there's so much more we could talk about. I just want, I want to make sure that we don't run out of time answering people's questions. So sure. knowing everything that we know, and again, let me know if you're not hearing me too clearly. <clears throat> um, let me unplug this as well, just in case. So what do we do? Uh, we talked about it the other day. We live in this world, paranoia is our, is our best friend, but like most humans, we're also incredibly curious as well, and, and it, it's that fine balance between should I click on it or, 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 or shouldn't I click on it? I've always said that the golden rule of security is it's, it's a battle of body parts. It's a battle between your brain and your index finger. Most of the attacks that are coming directly to users, we're not talking about uh, uh, necessarily account takeovers or identity theft, but the ones that are coming into your home through email require this. This is your weapon, your index right. finger. If your index finger is not getting the message from your brain to say, don't do that, slow it down, think before you click. So if you can rewire that connection between your brain and just your index finger, you can thwart most of the attacks that are coming through. I've always said that, you know, um, Hackers, criminals, cyber crooks can be really, really clever. They're not all, but many are really, really clever. Your grandmother could defeat them by just not clicking. If you don't click, they lose and you win. It's as simple as that, right? Or is it? That, that is correct. So, so understand with, with phishing emails, a phishing attack is a social engineering attack. It, it is there to psychologically manipulate you into giving up one of four things, information, access, data, or cash. So, if you just take a moment, and when I'm talking about phishing, I'm, not, I'm talking about more than just emails. It can be that phone call that's coming through. It can that, be that piece of physical mail that's arriving in your box. Just take a moment. Just objectively consider what's happening, okay? Because what a criminal does is, if it's coming through your phone, he's spoofing that phone number. Your caller ID is going to say the sheriff's office, the social security administration, your local bank, whatever. Take a moment to consider that, hey, just because it's showing on the phone does not mean that it is your bank or the sheriff's department or the IRS or any number of things like that. Take a moment to consider what that phone call is doing. Is it trying to manipulate you into giving up PII, into giving up cash, into going down to Walmart and picking up gift cards? Right. If it's doing that, just consider, is, is that logical? Is it logical? If you take a moment, if you don't get influenced by the emotion that's, that the, the attacker, that the criminal is trying to get you tricked into, into that emotional response, if you just step back from that, you're not gonna fall for that. So that does take care of that. Um, you had mentioned, now that doesn't take care of every single problem. For example, if I'm, if I'm looking to take over accounts, I've got your credentials, all right? Uh, if, you, if you've given me your credentials or if I've bought them from some data breach or something like that, I've got your login credentials. From there, it's very easy for me to get your social security number and your date of birth for $4. Once I have that, I go to something, someplace like Ben Verified, buy your background check, not only of you, but every single associate and family member you've got in the hopes of getting your mother's maiden name. Pretty easy to do that at that point. From there, I need the credit report. How do I do that? Well, I go to the same place you go, annualcreditreport.com. 
the thing in the, in the United States, we're based on what's called KBA, knowledge-based authentication. Those are the security questions that are asked when you sign up for accounts, when you change password and sign accounts, any number of things like that. So if I have the background check and the credit report, I can answer any KBA that I want to. So I go to annual credit report to get your credit report as a criminal. They ask those security questions. The thing about annual credit report is there's no time limit there. So I can take the background check that I've gotten from Ben Verified. I can take Google and try to answer all of those security questions. Usually I'm going to be able to answer those. If not, the only thing I have to do at that point is go over to Credit Karma where they ask the exact same security questions except the answers are different except for the correct answer. So sure. now I have your credit report. From there I go to, and you mentioned it a moment ago, social media. I go to LinkedIn to find out where you work. Once right. I find out there, I go to Glassdoor to find out how much you make, and then I pay a final trip to Facebook to find out if you've posted anything of interest. So I've got your complete identity at that point, and I can do whatever I want to to any account that I want to at that point. That's so I'm really, I'm really glad you're not doing that anymore, by the way. I just, I am too. I just took a deep breath. So we're getting other questions coming in. So what else? Um, Freeze your credit. I think freezing is far better than monitoring. Freeze, uh, when, when thieves commit identity theft, the number one kind they like is taking out new credit. Uh, otherwise, the next most popular is taking over existing accounts. So if you freeze your credit, you have that wall automatically up. Use a password manager. I'm a big fan of password manager managers. It, get, it, it overcomes all the excuses you make for avoiding good password practices. It creates the good passwords. It tells you what the, path, the bad passwords are. It, uh, <clears throat> it stops you repeating and reusing bad passwords. It'll actually tell you, you can't use that, move on. Uh, it'll right. store them securely. There's, very, very, there's no risk that we've known so far. Um, uh, what else on top of those? So, um, uh, well, I'm you took, the, you took the two big ones out, right? Uh, yeah, so so definitely. So I'm just getting a question in here because I think on the same subject. What password sure. managers would we recommend? I use LastPass and Dashlane. What about you? I, I use LastPass. I love LastPass. I don't, honestly, guys, I don't care what password manager you use. Just use one of them. And whatever you do, don't save the passwords in the browser. Now, right. there are password managers that are incorporated into Apple and a few other places that, that save it, that looks like it's in the browser. That's different. Do not right. save the password in the browser, okay? You mentioned uh, two of the big ones. Freeze the credit. Credit freezes became free September 18th of 2018. I don't go in for the credit alerts that the credit bureaus are going to try to talk you into. I go in for the credit freezes. It stops all new account fraud and frees the credit of every single person in the house, including children, because children are the number one victims of identity theft. One in four children will be a victim. So freeze right. the credit, period. Credit freeze. The next thing is, is understanding, you pointed that out a second ago, a credit freeze stops all new account fraud, okay? Right. So it works great for kids. For adults, it's still new account fraud. Those existing accounts can still be defrauded and taken over. So you have to monitor all accounts as well. Place alerts on the accounts where you can. For example, Discover Card has a $0 alert, meaning that if a criminal gets your, credit, your, your Discover Card information, if he just pings it to see if the card's still alive, you get a text message saying, right. hey, someone's trying to use your card. Sure. And take advantage yeah. of it. Pay attention to the alerts. Put the alerts in order. Monitor all accounts because nowadays when I was a criminal, the only accounts that mattered to us were credit card accounts, bank accounts. Nowadays, all accounts matter. Your retail accounts, your email accounts, your tax records, everything across the board matters. So you have to monitor all accounts. Make sure you can access all accounts and control all accounts. Yeah, and somebody posted a question there just a second ago. Um, lying about those secret answers, I think she said that her middle name or her surname perhaps or her brother's name, her brother's name I think maybe, was Dog's Bread, which obviously there's some family issues there that we're not going to dive into. But I mean, sure. so, so a common question that I get asked in, I, you know, for a, a bank account was, what was my favorite car? And sure. my answer is not a Maserati. Right. And now here's the problem with that. No one's going right, no so, to get, no one's going to, so you can lie and you should lie as long as you can remember what the answer to the, what the lie was. That's the problem. Well, it, but here's the issue with that. Okay. Sure. You can, you can tell lies all you want to about the security questions. 
about right. the mother's maiden name, about the first car, color of car, anything else like that. You can tell all the lies that you want to tell. At the end of the day, if I decide to spearfish you, which means I'm, I'm creating a fishing right. attack specifically for you. I've pulled your background check. I've pulled everything else. And I'm going, I'm wanting to ask those questions. All right. So I take over your account. I'm going to know that you've said, hey, my, my husband's, my mother's maiden name is Dog's Breath. All right. I'm going to have that answer anyway. I'm going to ask you that question. You're going to tell me the same incorrect right. answer on the phishing attack. So I still have the answer that I need at that point. Right. The problem is, is that we as a nation are still relying on those security questions. And that's the fault that criminals exploit at that point. We have to move to multi-factor authentication too, so that there Absolutely. are better ways, much better ways to do this. Uh, or maybe a an ECG scan on your watch that confirms to everyone that you're the only <laughs> well, person. Well, certainly MFA. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Right. We, we that need way. MFA. MFA biometrics, uh, those are those are right now the, the wave that we're going for. Absolutely. Right. So for the audience, MFA means multi-factor authentication. A simple example is when, for example, with, the, with their Gmail account, if they ask, ask you to add a mobile number so they can verify, that's a factor of authentication. A Naira scan, a fingerprint, that's a factor of authentication. multi right. simply means there's more than one. One of the questions that came in was, um, what was that other password manager I was referring to? It's Dashlane, D-A-S-H-L-A-N-E. And I should say, so I've worked with uh, Bartlett on these educational resources before. They have a lot of that information on their website anyway, and if they don't, they can share it with you. So don't get too paranoid about missing any of the answers here. They will be there. And there was a question about a credit freeze, how you do it. A credit freeze, and I have to say that the credit viewers fought this tooth and nail. I remember, I think it was 2000 or, two, or four, 2006 in California, they spent millions of dollars trying to persuade the California legislature that this was the worst thing that was going to happen to the credit industry. They lost, fortunately. But a credit freeze, simply go to each credit bureau, the three main consumer credit bureaus that you'd be familiar with, Experian, Equifax, uh, TransUnion, place the freeze. They will ask you for your information. It's entirely free of charge to do. It's now, thanks to legislation that just came in, I think it was last year, free for your kids too. Um, a, a, it's instant. You don't have to wait days. They will generate a pin for you, protect the pin, make sure that you don't lose that. And you can unfreeze temporarily or permanently at any time. It's a fantastic solution, but I have a word of caution because I've seen this. When people freeze their credit, they think they're now fully protected from identity theft. They drop their guard. They get apathetic. A credit freeze protects you from only one kind of identity theft, and thieves have a thousand. Right. So I, I agree with you completely. Okay. So... Um, just to make sure that we have enough time here. We've, we've got plenty of time, uh, I think. Yeah. Um, so um, when we were talking about the COVID scams earlier, um, one of the questions that was coming up with some people I was talking to was, uh, does it matter how affluent you are as far as these crimes are concerned? And kind of my first answer was no, and my second answer was maybe. And... The, the, I mean, the first thought was obviously so many of these are spray and pray attacks. They are just sending out millions of, 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 of emails, of phishing emails, and they really don't care who responds to them. But there are certain types of attacks, and again, quite often in email, that if you are more affluent, either they will recognize it and follow up and be persistent, maybe do the research, or you may actually fall for them. Three that come to mind. Charity scams. So we are seeing a wave, a tsunami of charity-related scams. And what we what we know from history is that the more affluent you are, the more likely you are to be involved in philanthropic projects. So the more likely you are um, to be not suspicious of getting a request um, for a donation to a charity. You think that's true? That that an individual who's you know maybe on on a list is used to getting these requests is in a a, a, as a social circle of, of generous givers is more likely to say, well, this feels normal, I'll click and suddenly I've lost. Sure, so, so here's the thing, okay? Everyone out there needs to realize that yes, a majority of cybercrime is spray and pray. You send out massive amounts of email, of phishing emails, 
and whatever you get back, that's what you get back. Okay. Right. So if I send out if I send out two million emails a day and I get two percent back, I've got you know twenty thousand emails of of whatever that is of PII. Now from that point though, I start to look at those emails. So today. I can buy someone's information. It's called a Fools, F-U-L-L-Z. It's a complete identity profile. From a low of $30 to a high of about $140 that consists of the complete identity of that person, that victim, right. okay? And that price is based on the location, the gender, and the credit score. The higher the credit score, the more valuable the victim is, the more money the victim is, it makes, the more profit I get as a criminal. You talked about uh, uh, um, charity scams. Charity scams are big right now with COVID. The thing is, is that a criminal, as a criminal, I do not want to stand out in a crowd. I want to be a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I want to blend in. So if I'm doing charity fraud, I'm not looking for someone that doesn't give money. I'm right. looking for someone that is used to being, you know, propositioned, is used to having those calls, those emails, asking them to donate. That's what I'm looking for. The sad thing is, guys, is, you know, if you don't have the money to give, you can't give. So I'm not looking for those people to victimize. I'm looking for the people who have that, the more money coming in. The more affluent you are, the, the more likely I am to try to get you, to try to scam you into giving me that fake charity, that amount of money. And I used to run charity scams as well. I mean, I'm not proud of that, but I used to do that as well. And you're not looking for people that can't give. You're looking for people that have given and will give because they're used to it. Yeah, and if, if we're going to see a recession, well, as we are seeing a recession, uh, we know that uh, cybercrime tripled after the last recession. So uh, I'm looking at some more questions that are coming in here. Oh, these are these are tough to answer. Let's, so let me pick the easy, easy one. Um, can a VPN deter criminal activity on the user end? So a VPN, virtual private network, it, it secures your connection as, you, as you're communicating with it to your phone, your mobile device or online. My... my view on the VPN is that it's like a freeze. It, it, it protects you against maybe one very specific and very narrow and pretty rare kind of threat. It doesn't protect you against all the other threats out there and the most important threats, the things that are really like to affect you. What do you think about uh, VPNs, Brett? I think the VPNs right now are, are, are very effective, as you said. Now, here's the thing, though. We are seeing chatter that VPNs can be compromised. There have been a few white papers that have written about that. Sure. There's been a few uh, instances at DEF CON where that's been shown to be. Now, that, as far as that being in the wild yet, that's not really out there. Is it going to happen where we're going to see VPNs compromised? Absolutely it is, because it's already being discussed that that possibility is there. So for right now, that's okay. Um, and as you say, I, I agree completely with everything you say with that caveat in mind, that VPNs are not always going to be you know, the, the high security type thing that they are now. Yeah, and I, I think, again, similar to the credit freeze, they give people a false sense of security. So I have something big, and it sounds really impressive. It's a private network. I don't have to worry about anything. It's simply just another layer. Um, and if you're not layering the security where it matters most, you're going to get impacted in other places. So another question, what does saving the password manager in the browser mean? Okay, so... When you when you go to sign on to uh, to create an account on eBay, if you're using Chrome, sometimes Chrome will say, "Do you want to save a password?" All right, so that's saving it in the browser. That's not part of a password manager. That's just saving it in the browser. The problem is, is I can do something called like a buffer overflow attack or something like that, and get that password sent to me if I want. Right. It's very easy for me to to use Wireshark and dehash the password or anything else that I need to. To, to get that type of password at that point. So understand that, okay? Now, there's a thing called a password manager that is part that can be part of the browser too. So understand there's a difference between a password manager saving that, that's asking you as you're, as you're signing up for websites, do you wanna save the, the password, compared to the browser just saving it. If it's just browser saving the password, that creates a huge issue all of a sudden, okay? so. Understand the difference, but always use a password manager because, again, we as human beings, we do not, we think we're being random. A human being, a human mind is not random. We always have some sort of predictability, of, uh, predictability to so, it, okay? So a password manager takes that out of your hand. 
use a password. So another a, a, another follow up on the credit freeze. Do you need to um, freeze with all three bureaus? Yes. So yes. what some people do. So what I used what I used to do. I would freeze two and leave the and monitor the other. So I would freeze like an Experian and a, and a an Equifax and and monitor TransUnion because the benefit of monitoring is if they have your information and they're trying you, your monitoring service will tell you that you're there. There you. You're now in their sites and you, you, you might need to take other precautions. If you've frozen all three, you're not going to get any pings or alerts because they'll be instantly blocked, correct? I mean, that, that's not a bad idea. It's, it's truly not. I, I typically freeze, that's what I do in my life. I freeze all, all three across the board um, and just allow, if I'm going to get a car finance or something like that, I alert the credit bureau that is going to be paying for the, uh, for the application for credit and they lift you know that. The freeze long enough for that, but that's not a bad idea at all. I could, I could, I could get behind that idea as long as here's the caveat to that: as long as you're paying attention to the credit bureau that you've not gotten the freeze on. Uh, we as human beings, we start to, we start out very diligent, very vigilant. We pay attention to all these things, and as time goes on, we become lazy. It's normal. It's natural. It's part of being a human. So if you're going to get lazy, you need to freeze it. Okay, that's what I would say. Right. And on that subject, not necessarily freezing, but monitoring, what do we think about identity protection or credit protection or credit monitoring services like LifeLock and, and the dozens that are out there? My personal opinion, and I actually used to work for some of these companies, I, I've kind of had a love-hate relationship with them, and largely because, you know, traditionally they've not been very honest in their, in their marketing and have paid large penalties and fines as a result. Uh, the one thing to know about identity protection services is that they don't stop identity theft. They will let you know if something's happening that's suspicious, and then you have to, you know, saddle up your horse and ride off and uh, uh, take on these thieves. They are very useful, or somewhat useful, if you are a victim, um, in that they will provide remediation, they may provide legal help, they may cover some out-of-pocket expenses, there are insurance components, there's someone nice and friendly to call up and, and kind of calm you down and walk you down and talk you down from this panic that you're going through. I think one of the many benefits, or one of the most attractive benefits is that they, they normally sign you up for alerts, not specifically to you, but just alerts about breaches and scams. That to me is the most important part because it's reminding you to remember the basic stuff that you should be doing, the basic habits and, and behaviors and, and routines you should be engaging in every day that will keep you one step ahead. Um, you got a similar take on them? I mean, I do. I, I have the same love hate relationship historically. I love to hate them. That being said, um, it goes back to that idea that I have uh, that we, I think that we need to have a proactive response to our own security. We need to know what's going on with our accounts. Right. I like the idea of that. But again, we as human beings, we get bored, we get tired, we get lazy, all things tend toward chaos. So the thing is, is that we start monitoring our own accounts, we're looking after our credit reports, we're looking at uh, the logins, everything else that's going on. Over time, it's natural, it's a natural human tendency that that starts to lag. We get, it takes a little bit longer to pull the credit reports, it takes longer to pay attention to everything that's going on. A monitoring company never gets tired. It's diligent. It stays there. Bam, 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 bam. So I do support that because of that, because of the idea that we as humans we we tend to fall off after a while. But that being said, I do believe it's extremely important that we also take a proactive response to our own security. You do not. You never want to say, "Okay, I've got a security company taking care of it. I don't need to worry about the money that's right. in my bank." No. You do need to worry about the money that's in your bank all the time, all right? Because that security company, I mean, yeah, they're, they're monitoring for you and everything, but you want to be aware of your finances and your security as well, okay? Yeah, and so and going back to when we were talking about all the data that's out there and available for, for criminals to use, why is, are there so many sites out there selling such intimate, personal, private information so easily? And it's, I mean... It's the same reason that the thieves are buying and selling it. It's valuable. Uh, and in many cases, it's, it's legal and legitimate. I, there, there's a famous individual who was a, a cocaine 
uh, distributor in Florida until he was caught and he flipped and worked for the FBI. And he decided the business he'd go into was uh, data collection. Um, and he amassed this treasure trove of billions of different files uh, on just about every human in America and just about every piece of it. He was getting, I think at one time, 10,000 different sources. I mean, he was buying information from uh, cities and counties and police departments on driver's licenses, on uh, uh, license plates. And he was amalgamating all this information and then selling it to private detectives for a couple of bucks ago. And it's not, it wasn't legal then and it's not legal now. And I remember someone from one of the, the three credit bureaus saying that they have more information on more Americans than the CIA, the NSA, and the FBI combined. So, you know, if, if I'm a, a, a thief and I don't want to play, you know, pay black market prices for your data, I can go to a very legitimate site and get almost the same amount of data there, correct? Absolutely. As, as I pointed out, I mean, at the end of the day, in today's world, the only thing of value is information, data. That's what matters is data. So from a criminal point of view, it's easy enough to get that. But criminals rely a lot on legal services like Ben Verified, um, Delve Point, TLO. TLO and Delve Point are these skip tracing type background check software lookups that when you do a background check pull on one of those services, and a criminal can do that for you know $20 if he does it illegally, or he can go and sign up for Delve Point or TLO and get the account pretty easily himself. Right. When you get a TLO or a Delve Point account, it comes with more information than you ever thought that anyone could ever have on you. You're talking uh, uh, driver's license scans, types of vehicles, the associates, the mother's maiden. I mean, it's the social, the date of birth, everything across the board is available on those background checks. And right. honestly, guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, you're not, the government lets it go on right now. I mean, you're not going to stop that. I mean, it's uh, this type of stuff. Someone like me, like I used to be, it's easy enough for me to get that data and use it however I want to use it as a criminal. But understand that it's not just criminals that have your data. It's most companies have access to the data anymore. Uh, Target, for example, they, they're, they're so good at data now. Target is able to see if a woman is pregnant before the husband knows. Uh, that, that's just right. a fact. Yes. And they're able to anticipate all this stuff. On their behavior. And we never the know. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, so I remember. I'm going to interject I, just a moment because we're sure. pretty close to the top of the hour, and I recognize that some people may need to uh, log off, but we'll be on for a couple more minutes because I know there are some other questions. Sure. Uh, so someone someone asked, uh, why not with all that information be available to almost anyone? Well, the reason it's available is because the people selling it are making a small fortune from it, and it's not against the law. So the idea when the, these, these, these uh, databases originally began to be created uh, it was for private detectives and skip tracers. If, you know, you could find every connection to someone that you're looking for, and if they're not at this house, well, you have mom's house, you've got grandma's house, they're not driving this car, they might be driving that car. So there's, as, as Brett said, you know, all data is of value to someone. And the more they have of it, the more they can combine it, the more they can weaponize it, the more of, the, of it they want. So unfortunately, it's, lot, it's not legitimate uh, or illegitimate, uh, it's not illegal, and until it is, uh, anyone can get your information if they want to badly enough. Agreed. So I'm looking through here. Okay. Uh, so I think we're done. If anyone has got any final questions, want to throw it in, we'll stay here. I know people have got to get away. They've got to move on. They have other things to do. Can't think what. It's so interesting. But um, <laughs> uh, if anyone wants to uh, keep chatting, Brett and I are willing to keep chatting. If you want to follow up afterwards, Bartlett can uh, help you with that. And again, Bartlett have got some fantastic resources that listed a lot of the, the tools and the precautions and the tips and the behaviors that we're talking about. So by all means, uh, contact Bartlett and uh, um, uh, ask them. Neil, I do have one quick question. You know, one of the things that we uh, struggle with sometimes is the um, email uh, that our clients use, you know, like AOL is problematic, even Gmail is problematic. Um, 
So, you know, I'm like one of the many COVID parents. I have a, a child at home who's telling me what I need to do to get off of Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So she said I should use Proton for email. Right. Is that a good site or do you have recommendation for others? Yes, yeah, so I've used Proton Mail. Uh, it was created to be secure and non-invasive and non-surveillance. Um, uh, you know, Google makes money by by tracking what you're doing on its free email accounts. Uh, Proton is good. Um, not a lot of users still use it, at least compared to the more common ones. So you may have difficulty setting up it up. It's not as as transparent or as easy to use necessarily. Uh, but I certainly use it if you are security conscious to the point of a little paranoid. And I would add in with uh, with Proton Mail that uh, I use. Pro I, I work with a lot of law enforcement, and I work. I talk to criminals all the time. Criminals love Proton Mail. Law enforcement loves Proton Mail because of the security and the privacy. It is. It's extremely good for them. Yeah, I'm getting a question in uh, about RSA, and I'm assuming it's RSA authentication. So RSA, it's a company, it's a form of authentication, it's a public key system that, uh, and quite often it comes in the form of like a, 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 a token. That's the multi-factor authentication I was talking about. So if you're an employee, for example, and you're offered RSA as a token for authentication, absolutely do use it. It's these are some of the most established security experts out there. They invented the, the, the security world that we know it. So by all means, use it. Just seeing if there are any, any other questions. Kelly, do you have any questions before we, before we wrap it up? No, nope, I think that's it. Um, well, you've prompted a lot of other questions and action that uh, I probably need to take. So it was a little bit overwhelming. So we uh, didn't mean to scare people too much, but I think we need to be scared to the point that uh, we are a little more proactive uh, about our personal and business um, uh, dealings on the internet so that we're all aware of that. Uh, so I would thank both of you, Brett and Neil, for um, hosting today. And you know we may even get more questions in the aftermath. But again, um, as Neil mentioned on our website, you can uh, get a lot of tips from there. And I hope that everyone found this a valuable discussion today. And thanks to both of you. Uh, for taking your time. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're signing off. <laughs>